Hi, all, and uh, thank you for joining the session. Um, like Patrick mentioned, my name is Saad Malik. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Spectral Cloud. And so today we'll talk about the next phase of Kubernetes management, you know, specifically looking at declarative management and how to do so with cluster API. Next slide. Okay, so a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm the guy who likes to build and tinker with new technologies, you know, especially in the areas of Linux, virtualization, containers. I was part of a early cloud startup called Clicker Technologies, where we focus on multi-cloud application management. And that is actually where we first started working with Docker containers and container orchestration platforms like Apache Mesos and then the early versions of Kubernetes. So Clicker was acquired by Cisco in, 20, in 2016. And then we started seeing firsthand just how quickly the world was changing, where organizations and enterprises across all verticals were transforming themselves to become technology first companies and to offer best in class experiences to their customers or employees, either via applications or other digital mediums. So with this, of course, came a significant mindset shift, you know, as companies started adopting a DevOps culture and embracing these cloud native technologies like containers, Kubernetes. So in 2019, um, along with other key executives from Clicker Technologies, uh, we left to start Spectra Cloud to really focus on making Kubernetes accessible and approachable to everyone. So let's take a step back and see where are we today with the Kubernetes adoption. Right, as all of you guys know, Kubernetes has become that de facto standard in running containers. It's become that common control plane, that common operating system that not only helps you build your application, but also helps you manage your application. And what we're finding is that not only are containers and Kubernetes usage and adoption increasing, but it, it is also accelerating. Uh, in fact, we at Spectral Cloud sponsored a research from an independent company called Dimensional Data uh, to interview 160 or so Kubernetes practitioners and their executives. And the findings actually validate that the growing number of Kubernetes clusters, and more importantly, that many of these practitioners of Kubernetes are deploying many more clusters into production very soon. So why is that? Well, I mean, if you take a look at the promise of Kubernetes from its get-go, it promised a very robust and scalable container orchestration platform uh, with promises of true portability of your workloads and at the same time being able to help drive your efficiencies. Um, it was meant to be the holy nirvana. Um, unfortunate truth is, and the hard reality is that Kubernetes really hasn't lived up to its expectations. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the reasons why I think that's the case. So first of all, uh, when we talk about Kubernetes, it's not just one thing. When we look at Kubernetes, we're talking about cobbling together hundreds of different integrations across the entire ecosystem. I mean, today in the CNCF landscapes, there are over 1,700 different technologies across many different layers. And it's not just about managing each integration's lifecycle, but also making sure that these integrations play nice with each other. So Kubernetes technically, if you think about it, it's just a piece of software. It's the control plane components like the etcd, the API server, the scheduler, and an agent called a kubelet, which runs on the worker nodes. Um, if you ask the actual or industry, you ask the vendors, they'll tell you that Kubernetes itself is four different layers. The operating system, the Kubernetes itself, the networking layer and the storage layers. Um, but what I believe and our, our, we believe is that the reality is that Kubernetes is the total value and experience that a complete Kubernetes provides. This is what your developers think of with Kubernetes when everything is deployed in inside of it. So this, by the way, is a quick screenshot of our product Spectral Cloud Palette, um, and that's a real stack. Uh, on average, we find that customers deploy 12 to 15 different integrations, which belong in any one cluster. Well, everything from your logging, your monitoring, ingress, security, search manager, you name it. There's just so many different layers of technologies that you have to add into a Kubernetes cluster to make it real. So let's talk about Kubernetes management. Uh, there are two different groups. Uh, there are the DevOps and IT ops, uh, mainly I'm assuming most of you, your team and your guys. Um, that's probably where you guys have to look at the clusters, manage the clusters, manage the complexity of these clusters and be able to hand them over quickly to developers in a flexible way. 
developers really don't care about Kubernetes, and especially they don't care about the lifecycle management of the Kubernetes clusters. Uh, what they do care about are the stacks and layers and application services that runs in the Kubernetes because their code and the applications that they're building are consuming these dependencies and, and running on top of them. So where do these complexities come from? So the first dimension you know, which complicates things is the different locations or environments where Kubernetes can be deployed, where the underlying infrastructure can be a public cloud, can be a private cloud, data center, bare metal, and even edge. Uh, we're seeing lots of interesting use cases with Kubernetes even at edge now. The other angle of complexity is around the multiple de development teams. Now, large organizations don't just have a single development team, they have multiple. And within those development teams, they might have different diverse projects with different needs. In the end, they all have different requirements in terms of what they want their Kubernetes to look like for their entire stack to look like. The third dimension that complicates things is time. It's easy to design and potentially deploy what we call day zero and day one, but things get increasingly complicated as your business requirements and ultimately your application requirements change over time. So basically when we we're talking about Kubernetes, we're talking about a multi-dimensional kind of rubrics queue that makes it very difficult to manage and across, across these different environments, you know, across these different teams with their unique requirements, um, and then also the changing business you know, requirements as well too. So how can cluster API help? Well, let's start off by looking at a typical adoption journey of customers. Uh, most customers start at the experimentation phase, uh, which frequently is initiated by the development teams. Um, but as they move to production, DevOps and IT operations, and in many cases, you know, do take ownership of these clusters. And at that time, look for solutions or products that can help manage these clusters um, and, and their life cycles. In the experimentation phase, there is a disconnected, disconnected experience uh, when it comes to managing the different layers. You know, IT ops or the DevOps engineer would have to manage separately the machines, the operating system, the Kubernetes core layers, as well as the networking storage, and then of course manage all the additional application services that sit on top. Generally, these are facilitated, facilitated by scripts, which can be very costly to maintain over time. Also risk prone if some kind of change happens in a script that doesn't align with the other layers. Um, and it makes it really impossible and difficult to manage across because of all the different dimensions that we, you know, we talked about. So basically what cluster API solves, you know, at least for the core layers, is a providing a unified management where the infrastructure, the machines themselves, the operating system and the Kubernetes layers are all managed as a simple unified experience. Now, just going a little bit deeper into cluster API, it's one of the most popular Kubernetes orchestration tools. Um, it's governed by the cluster lifecycle SIG. So it's, uh, and, and the an amount of vendors that are using it today is just increasing. Um, if you take a look at most modern Kubernetes management platforms from VMware Tanzu to Google Anthos, uh, even Red Hat OpenShift has an earlier version. And now Rancher with the latest version of RKE2 is also utilizing cluster API. It's, they're using it because it provides such a cohesive way of managing the life cycle of your bare metal, of your machines, uh, whether it's bare metal or public cloud or private cloud, um, and is able to unify it in a way that makes it simple to even manage the day two management of these, uh, of these machines. So Cluster API is a declarative management system, right? What is the reason for managing the, the actual Cluster API as code? If you think about it, right, the way you manage your Kubernetes constructs today, like your namespaces, your deployments, your services, RBAC, everything, Kubernetes itself is a declarative system. So the question I have is, why wouldn't you wanna manage the lifecycle of your infrastructure? Just like um, if even for your Kubernetes clusters, the same way you manage your Kubernetes applications, right? It's simple to read and intuitive. It describes what the desired state needs to be, not how to do it. I mean, just think about how useful it is to be able to describe in a very few lines of code or YAML that I'm deploying a end-to-end -end Kubernetes cluster on a public cloud. 
versus doing it on bare metal. The description of how to do it is not specified in the declaration, it's just defining this is the target state that I'm looking for. Uh, not only is it used, this declarative approach used for the initial creation, but it also used to drive your updates and day two management. And in many cases, the recovery is done by just reverting the declarative state to the previous one. So for instance, if, a, if you make a modification the, and the, it's not a healthy modification, you can easily revert back to the previous state and recover the system. Um, also, generally with declarative platforms, unless you have data, you don't really need to back up the actual databases, right? What you do is you would just replace the entire declarative uh, state of the system into a brand new cluster and voila, within minutes, your application should come back fully up and running. So with Cluster API, it does provision multi-master CNCF conformant clusters. Um, and here's, I think the key is that it provisions the underlying cloud cluster primitives. Um, everything from your compute, your storage and networking. Uh, and because it manages the infrastructure, it also provides very advanced resiliency and error recovery capabilities. And of course, I already mentioned a little bit on some of these day two lifecycle management capabilities, like providing scaling and upgrading, uh, whether it's for your nodes or your pools, and then also helps you know, upgrading your core Kubernetes version. So because Cluster API component is just a typical Kubernetes cluster, right? it uses the same Kubernetes style APIs that we're all used to, the same tooling that we use from kubectl or using GitOps or Flux or Argo CD can be used as is uh, with Cluster API. Uh, a little bit about specifically how Cluster API works is it's built around the concept of abstractions where you define an abstraction or CRD for a cluster, for a machine, for defining how multiple machines are tied together. And then for different cloud environments, for different locations, there are an implementation for these abstractions in, in a, something called a provider. So there's a provider for Amazon, for Azure, for Google, for VMware, bare metal, that know how do you take these abstractions like clusters and machines and actually manifest into the specific target cloud. Uh, for example, inside of an Amazon cloud, when you are provisioning an EKS cluster, right, it'll provision the EKS control plane, it'll provision the EC2 worker nodes, it'll provision the uh, EBS disks. If you're provisioning inside of a VMware cluster or a VMware environment, it'll just be VMware specific constructs like deploying the VMs into a compute cluster on a resource pool, uh, leveraging VMDK for the storage disks, you know, and so on. So with that, um, I was thinking, let's get into a little bit of demo of just how Cluster API makes things, things, uh, things really simple. Uh, we'll begin by provisioning an EKS cluster, you know, showing the EKS is running, doing some day two operations on top of it, and then showing just how easy it is with the same interface uh, deploying and managing a bare metal cluster. Give me one second. Uh, let me go ahead and switch to my terminal. So in my terminal here, I have a, a kind cluster running on my laptop that has the actual cluster API components uh, completely running inside of it. Um, you can notice that I have the, the cluster API components like the Capi controller manager. This is the main controller. And for each of the clouds that we will be provisioning into, there is a provider. Um, here for bare metal, we're using a technology called canonical mass. Uh, you can think of it like a bare metal management interface. Um, and this is where the implementation for cluster API for mass resides. And then for Amazon, we're leveraging the cluster API Amazon provider. Um, if we take a look at what the actual manifest looks like. So we go into the EKS folder here and I can take a look at this CAPI EKS2.yaml. This is where the actual abstractions and the specific details for how do you provision or what are the details for an Amazon cluster. So here we're defining a cluster called EKS2. You can define some common properties like what is the actual pod sitter. And then you define that this specific cluster is the Amazon managed control plane. Essentially, this is an EKS cluster. If we were to follow this link, this EKS2 control plane, we notice the details specifically to EKS which version of EKS to deploy, which region to deploy the cluster in, um, and for the actual worker nodes, what is the actual SSH key uh, to inject. Um, then you can define one or more machine pools. These are the actual worker nodes that join in with the cluster. 
So here we can take a look that we're tying in this EKS2 pool um, to the same cluster, EKS2. And we're specifying by default, I wanna have a desired state of three worker nodes. Um, and that the specific details of what else EKS managed node groups need are specified in this EKS pool zero. Here we're specifying that, oh, by the way, that I also wanna enable auto scaling where you have a minimum size of one and a maximum of five. The default is gonna be three, but obviously as loads come in and out, you can automatically scale between uh, one and five. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go ahead and deploy the actual cluster to do kubectl apply dash F, capi EKS two. You run it, notice that all of these different resources that you define inside of the capi EKS two are now created. Um, you there can have a really interesting command called cluster kubectl describe to show what is the actual state of the system itself, right? So at this point, there is a reconciliation loop that is happening where a VPC is gonna be created in the next few minutes or so. And once the VPC is created, it's gonna start provisioning the control plane and after the control plane, provision the actual, the worker nodes. Um, what I have, because this will take around 15, 20 minutes to finish end to end, is I have an existing cluster um, that I provisioned a few minutes ago called CAPI EKS1. Um, if you take a look at the constructs for this cluster, it's very similarly defined. You know, your pod sitters, your control plane, your machine pools, uh, everything is essentially the same. Um, I can do the same command to look at the details of this cluster. I can say describe cluster EKS1, right? Notice that this case, the cluster is fully up and running in a healthy state and everything is provisioned. Uh, they also have a really fancy command to, to download the kube config directly from the cluster. So I can run that command, the kube cluster, uh, cluster cuddle, get the kube config from EKS1 and save it to a file kube config EKS1. I can run that. And then in another terminal, right, what I can do is I can, I can actually set my kube config environment variable uh, to this file. And then of course, if I can run kube cuddle get pods, right, this should now be my EKS cluster, right? Notice that everything is up and running. And of course we can run another application. And of course, the fun one here is Nginx app. And within a few seconds, you'll see obviously a brand new application of Nginx uh, being deployed in the, in the cluster. Um, I also mentioned that with this declarative approach, you get day two management capabilities like upgrades and, and scaling. How, how easy is that? So if we go back into this CAPI eks oneyaml it's as easy as just specifying a new number for the number of replicas or specifying a new version uh, for the control plane to use. Uh, for now, we'll just specify instead of three number of workers, let's go to five workers. And so here, all we're gonna be doing is doing a cube cuddle apply and save this CAPI EKS1 back into my, my management cluster. Uh, notice that none of the, the cluster abstraction changed, the AWS managed control plane didn't change. The only one that did get modified is the machine pool. And of course, within a few minutes, if I was to run a kubectl get nodes command, right, you would see a brand new node getting added um, with, to, to satisfy the new desired state. So this was uh, more specifically on the EKS portion. Now I'm gonna show you in the same management cluster, how we can provision a, a uh, bare metal cluster. So we uh, at Spectral Cloud did open source this cluster API mass provider that makes it as simple to manage your bare metal clusters as it is on a public cloud. Um, if we were to take a look at what the specifications for a, a mass cluster looks like, right? Again, you, you start off with the actual cluster definition. This is the, the common piece of configuration that applies to any cloud. Uh, the same pod sitter and service sitters can be specified here, but the infrastructure reference for this cluster is a mass cluster. Um, on MAS, you specify what is the actual DNS domain name that the clusters bind to. So that is specified in the specific implementation for MAS cluster. This is called MAS SC. Um, and then you define, of course, your MAS machine templates. You know, when you're creating machines, what does the actual structure look like? We're specifying fine machines in the canonical bare metal uh, interface that have at least two CPUs, at least four gigs of memory are deployed on a specific failure domains using a specific image of Kubernetes. And we can specify the number of workers to deploy. In this case, I'm only deploying a single worker, uh, but notice that it's very similar 
uh, the kind of specifications are very similar, no matter if you're doing EKS, MAS, or any other cluster technology. So for this one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the exact same operation. We're gonna do a QPuddle apply F and specify MAS cluster two. This creates all the various resources. And then we can follow the actual, the provisioning state of these, uh, of this one here by running a describe command. And here I can type in my cluster two, right? Notice that it's already beginning to provision the actual machines on the cluster. And again, with this, we're provisioning a bare metal box, pixie booting it, flashing an Ubuntu operating system on top of it, and then managing the Kubernetes layers uh, sitting completely on top of that. So with that, uh, that's the end of the demo, but feel free if you have any questions regarding the EKS MAS or any other um, provider, uh, ask them in the question sections, please. And let me go back to the actual uh, demo, one second, uh, to my PowerPoint presentations. So that was the CAPI demo. Obviously you saw how it simplified the unification of the bare metal machines, the operating system and the Kubernetes, but that's not really the end of the story. Is cluster API enough? So let's take a look at where we left off the complexity. In the early productization phase, uh, where CAPI becomes more and more popular, uh, we're finding that more and more users are, of course, using it. The, the challenge that IT operations has is that, you know, regardless if they're managing multiple different locations, unique requirements, different teams, they have to still manage the complexity that sits on top, which are the application services. This is where we think there is a gap, right, where Kubernetes declarative management comes in. It should be more about not only managing the machines, the operating system and the Kubernetes, but also all the application services. So essentially extending that unification of the core layers that includes the, these layers here, all the way to include the application services that sit on top of it. And this is what, what we focus on at Spectre Cloud. So we took the concept of cluster API and essentially built our own orchestration around it, extending to the additional layers sitting on top. We added the day zero, day one, and day two management functionalities uh, to support any operation, especially in day two, and to support any target environment from your public cloud to private data center, or even edge. And now we also do support importing your existing targets in cluster and managing the lifecycle, even of those environments. And this is the whole palette, Spectra Cloud palette that we, uh, that we built. What Palette does is it provides you a peace of mind to be able to fully manage your clusters in a declarative approach with all the various layers, uh, with many out of the box day two operations from backup restore, RBAC management, and even cost visibility into your clusters. Um, and the way we simplify the management of these clusters is through our concept of what we call the cluster profile. You can think of it like a blueprint or a recipe for provisioning and stamping out multiple different clusters, regardless of which uh, environment they go into, and still using this blueprint for managing the day one and day two lifecycle of these clusters. We, with Pallet, we also wanna make sure that we work with your existing tool sets and tool chains. Uh, we don't wanna force you to use a specific provider, whether it's Git or CICD pipeline. We provide a number of out of the box integrations with Ansible and Terraform, in fact, the Terraform provider that we provide is the number one downloader provider, downloader provider in the container orchestration category. Um, and we provide a number of out-of-the-box integration choices that span from logging and monitoring and security and service mesh, but we make it really easy for customers to be able to bring in their own tooling, right? Whether to bring in their own Helm charts or customized or any of these manifest layers. So with that, um, you, please do come uh, talk to us, you know, wherever you are with your cloud native and Kubernetes journey, whether you're starting now or moving your containers into production, and we can help you simplify, you manage all your Kubernetes environments. Um, by the way, um, if you're interested in Palette and what it brings to the table, we are offering free access for the first five users who have Kubernetes projects. Um, and then by the way, if you have any, um, any specific questions regarding Kubernetes um, or cluster API, uh, me and my team are very help, happy to help out you know, with these kind of questions. Uh, feel free to send me an email or tweet at me. My, my Twitter handle is saamolik. Um, and with that, Patrick, are there any questions for us?
Yes, uh, I could see a few questions in the chat. Just let me check um, if all of them are actually marked as a question because some are, I think, just posted in the chat. Um, okay, I will just start with the last one. Uh, could we make a difference between uh, palette and cluster API or does it dist um, distinguish between it? Yep, yep, absolutely. So let me go ahead and share one more time. The desktop two. So. Yeah. So what Palette does is it wraps around cluster API to provision the application services that sit on top. Right, so all the different layers that we talked about from your logging, your monitoring, your security are essentially the layers that Palette itself helps manage on top of it. Um, on top of that, the capabilities I mentioned, like the day two backup restore, the RBAC management, the cost visibility, these are all features that are built into Palette to kind of provide that end-to-end -end experience. What Cluster API does is provide a unified experience for managing the core layers. Right, being able to provision in any infrastructure environment from your EKS to your bare metal, um, managing the operating system itself and managing the Kubernetes configuration. So, so that's a distinction that we sit on top of Palette, uh, top of cluster API to manage the, the clusters, but then of course, Pallet provides capabilities uh, on top of that. Okay, um, they, uh, I will just ask all the questions, even though uh, your colleague uh, Pedro already uh, answered some of them quickly, but maybe you can uh, go into depth with that as well. Sure, sure. And um, so, uh, so for the question was, is there support for EKS upgrade? And uh, your colleague already uh, asked to to expand on that question. So. It means more uh, the capability to upgrade the Kubernetes version of nodes uh, running on AKS. So that was uh, the precise question elaborated on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this is the portion of the technology cluster API provides. Not only does it do scaling of your, your nodes and your different pools, but it does provide the upgrade lifecycle management for the control plane nodes and for the workers. Um, when you're using managed Kubernetes services, like EKS, GKE from Google or AKS from Azure, that upgrade lifecycle is handled um, by the providers, you know, by the actual, uh, by the cloud providers, but cluster API of course has hooks into it to invoke the proper API so that it can also upgrade um, the lifecycle, of the upgrade the versions of Kubernetes. Okay, there's a question about the, uh, possibility to man uh, to manage AKS Fargate clusters uh, using uh, CAPI. Yep, absolutely. So if you take a look, and this is something I can even show in a demo. Give me one second. So if you want to understand what are the different capabilities, right, that a cluster API provider is able to implement, I think the best way of looking at it is either documentation, but you can also run the explain command we looks at what are the fields that are configurable. So let's take a look at this Amazon managed machine pool spec, right? What are the actual fields that you can manage inside of it? So here I'm gonna do a kubectl um, cube explain into the managed machine pool spec. Notice you can manage things like your AMI type, your AMI versions, availability zones. In here as well, there's the ability to modify and manage your Fargate profile. So you can also attach Fargate can be managed through cluster API as well. Okay, I think there aren't any further questions at this point. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I guess you will be happy and also your colleague, I guess, to answer any question that still is coming up later maybe. And uh, yeah, you shared your credentials, I guess, as well. So people can connect with you and ask any questions if they, uh, yeah, if what they come up with them later um, or rewatch the talk later as well. Of course, we will upload it as usual. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Saad, for joining us today. I'm 